Hello, welcome to the Apostolic Church of Enfield's digital service. Uh, we are still working out some bugs, so be patient with us. But it is Sunday night, March 22nd, 2020. We're glad you're joining us. We'd like to begin tonight. If you want, join in song as Sister Lila Dupuy plays for us. I'll praise Him. I can. I'll praise Him. Love is my love. Love me like the sea. I'll praise Him. The name of Jesus. Lift up the name. The name of Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not going to be checking to see whether you're standing for the reading of the scriptures or not. I'm not going to be, although I need you to understand my respect for the word of God is unbounded. Uh, tonight, I want to talk to you with the message titled, Winds Through the Fig Trees and Shadows on the street. Text beginning with is Ephesians 4, verse 10. He that descended is the same also that ascended far up above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up unto him, into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Next text I'd like you to pay attention to is in Acts chapter 5, starting with verse 12. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And of the rest durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them. And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes both of men and women, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that 
at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them that were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed every one. Finally, for the text, Hebrews chapter 10 in verse 1. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never, with those sacrifices they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. You might note that the word perfect does not mean flawless. It means complete or whole. These three passages in God's word present the combined images that provoke the thought of my message to you tonight. I think it prudent for me and beneficial to you that I take the time to explain something about the particular conceptual uses of these illustrative words throughout the thousands of years of scriptural history. The fig tree and its leaves, various winds, shadows, and streets. Now, I'm not wanting or needing to limit the illustrative application of these things to the particular application I'm offering in this message. But I would like you to accept my application for the purpose of the message I have for you to receive tonight. Fig trees and their roots, or their leaves. Scripture gives us significant evidence that the overall experience of God's people can be illustrated by three trees, the vine, the fig, and the olive. I don't want to go into much detail, nor attempt to prove the validity of this typology. It's not vital to the point of my message. The illustrations are merely to paint a picture in your thinking so that the point of this message can become clear to you. The vine is generally representative of the political systems under which men live their lives. Fig trees generally are representative of the religious systems under which we live our lives. And the olive tree is a symbol of the spiritual life of God's people. My message tonight will not offer a demonstration of the validity of that typology, but I will use some of it to illustrate the point of the message. In particular, I want to use the image we have the fig trees as the religious systems that we have developed. And I remind you of my title, Winds Through the Fig Trees and Shadows on the Street. At the same time, I wish to use winds, and I hope you'll notice the plural, not singular. It's winds, not the wind, but winds. I want to use winds in one of the significant but under-recognized ways the word is used in scripture. Winds, as the purveyors of various spiritual phenomena and momentum for various teachings or doctrine that can have deleterious effects on children, the spiritually unlearned and immature. Ephesians 4.14 specified that to us, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. It goes on to tell us that we need to grow up. Shadows don't miss this. Shadows are always the product of something occulting or coming between the source of illumination 
and the destination of its light. It is an inescapable fact. There can be no shadow without the object that casts the shadow having blocked the light source. Light never casts a shadow. I know the scriptures, I'll deal with it. That does not mean that all shadows are somehow evil. There are times and situations in which it is good to have shade. Listen to these scriptures. Psalm 17, eight says, keep me as the apple of the eye, hide me under the shadow of thy wings. Psalms 36, Seven says, how excellent is thy loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of thy wings. Psalm 57, 1 says, be merciful unto me, O God. Be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. Psalm 63, 7 says, Because thou hast been my help, therefore in the shadow of thy wings will I rejoice. And of course, that wonderful Psalm 91, 9, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Even so, I would ask you to ponder the apparent paradox contained in those verses. The shadow of the light. 1 John 1 5 tells us, this then is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. There's a little paradox to be in the shadow of the light. How thankful I am to know the truth. Streets are familiar to all of us. They are the ways we take to go from one place to another. If enough people trod over the same course through open country, in a short time it becomes recognized as a way. I noticed this in college. They had sidewalks through the meadows that students were to walk on to get from building to building. But, you know, we kids had a way of taking shortcuts. And pretty soon, instead of grass, we had a little path. And next thing you know, that way becomes the way from one particular place to another particular place. If a community has built up around a way, it becomes a street. Many communities grow large enough to require multiple streets, but all streets are the courses people take to go from one place to another. Have you ever taken a street that did not get you to the place you intended to go? I have. I've learned that just being on a street does not guarantee I'll get where I wanna go. I've also learned that there are powers which can enforce a detour from the street upon which I want to go. Now, I hope to use these images to create in your minds an effective illustration of the point of my message, which I've tried to capture in the title. To remind you, I want to read again from Acts chapter 5, starting at verse 12. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And of the rest durst no man join himself to them. But the people magnified them and believed. And believers were the more added to the Lord. Multitudes, both of men and women, insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at the least 
the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed, every one. In the days previous to those mentioned here in Acts 5, 15 and 16, the apostles were used of God to work some signs and wonders. Chapters 3 and 4 even detail some of the things done and the tremendous way they affected the multitudes of onlookers. At least some of the leaders questioned how the man who was lame from his mother's womb was made whole. Peter did his best to shine the light into the closed or blinded eyes of the people and to get them to look to and see the same Jesus Christ of Nazareth whom they had crucified. Acts 4.8 said, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him does this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. In spite of Peter's valiant effort to deflect the attention of the people from himself and his fellow apostles unto the Lord Jesus Christ, it seems the imaginations of the people refused to be focused upon the Lord, but stayed upon his ministers. Every sign and wonder elevated the mortal men whom God had used to a stature above his fellows. In this specific incident in Acts 5, Peter had been thrust into the brightest of the spotlight that was then shining into the lives of the people of Jerusalem. And the people ignored the light and set their desires and hope on the shadow, especially that of Peter. Those people were so far from God that they actually believed that their afflictions might well be cured by nothing more than the darkness cast by Peter's flesh occulting the shining light of the sun. Look at the scripture. Is there any statement about someone actually being healed of any sickness or any other problem by Peter's shadow passing over them? Scripture makes no mention of any positive result from the shadow, either stationary or passing by. It tells us that the imaginations of the people were that they might be healed if Peter's shadow somehow touched them. That probably explains why we haven't developed schools to teach ministers how to maximize their shadows as they walk down the streets of our community. Human beings imagine some confounding doctrines when they look upon the mortals through whom our God and Savior might do something that benefits us. To this day, if any one of his ministers is involved in a sign or wonder wrought among the public, a certain power of fame can have negative effects. My message tonight or whenever you see, hear, or read it is simple. Don't go chasing the winds of doctrine that make much ado within the branches of your religious organization. 
neither go chasing after the shadows cast by those who allow their temporary passing by to occult the light. Winds come and go and do their own thing. But Jesus said that even of the wind. Shadows bring no glory to the Lord, but are dispelled by light. I beseech you to look around the shadow, to look beyond the earthly obstacle that blocks the light of the, nor the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It's not the preacher. It's not the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, or the teacher that brings about the miracle or the wonder or the sign. Seek the Lord with your whole heart. Blessed are they that keep his testimonies that seek him with the whole heart. Do not pursue the winds of doctrine, nor chase after shadows on the streets. Lila, please play a closing song for us, and then I will pray a dismissal prayer. Thank you for joining us for this message tonight. And if you would, please bow your heads. Allow me to close this service with our prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for being the light of the world. And thank you for being a light in whom is no darkness, neither shadow of turning. Thank you for shining so often into our lives, into our existence and bringing us the light of your glory. Lord Jesus, you are a wonderful God and a great Savior. Help us not to divert our attention from you to your servants. Help us to pay attention to your servants' messages, to learn what they have to tell us about you, but not to follow after the winds of doctrine, not to follow after the shadows on the street, but to keep our eyes on you and be led by your spirit. We thank you for it, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.